Okay, this video is going to dive a little deeper into olfaction. And I want to start by looking at how our system detects and analyzes odorants. Remember, I said odorants are the chemicals, like the molecules that float through the air and land in our nose that activate our sensory neurons for smell. So when you cook bacon, certain odorants waft through the air. These are you know, molecules that are landing in our nose. And I hate to break it to you, but when you take a dump and it smells bad, there are molecules, harmless little molecules, coming off your feces that are reaching your nose and activating your smell-based neurons and, and giving you that sense of, ooh, this smells bad. So smell works by molecules coming off an object, traveling through the air into our nose, and odorants are those molecules. Now, let's start with the psychophysical question, just detecting odors, like really subtle odors. When can we smell it? What, what we might call the, the olfactory threshold or the absolute threshold for smell. One common procedure would be we just kind of randomly present pairs of stimuli each time in these two like test tubes, like smelling from the two different test tubes. In one of them, we'll have a tiny amount of the odorant versus in the other one, we have no odorant. And the subject just has to say which one smells stronger, which one they think they smell something in. So we usually use a, a forced choice procedure here, meaning they have to answer either one or two. They can't pass. They just have to say, I think I smell something more in this one. So with a tiny enough amount of the odorant, they may not detect it at all, right? They might not be able to guess right. They just kind of have a 50% chance. But if there's a large and obvious amount of the chemical in there, a lot of the odorant, then they'll always choose the correct side. That means if they were, if they were just guessing, if they, if they couldn't actually smell a thing, so it was just guesses, they would get it right 50% of the time, right? Because they're choosing between two test tubes. So we, you know, try this procedure. We might do it with different amounts of the odorant and, uh, you know, a certain level of parts per billion of the odorant in the air, right? In the test tube. And we want to find when they start getting it right more consistently than 50% of the time, like more consistently than just chance guessing. So usually we would define the threshold, oops, sorry. Usually we would define the threshold as 75% right. Like when they can, the, the absolute threshold is when they can detect the odorant about 75% of the time, because it's halfway between not being able to detect it at all and being able to get it right every single time. So it's a point where they're sort of unsure, but they're getting it right more than they would from guessing. That's the absolute threshold for smell, an easy way to test it. Again, you'd have to do this for different chemicals and, and trying out different amounts of the chemical to find that threshold. Now, that means that the threshold is going to differ for different chemicals. So we have to do this test for different odorants to see what the absolute threshold is. And for something like... Um, you know, methanol, for example, it takes a fair amount. And, and even likewise for acetone, something you might think of as a pretty strong smell because that's, that's nail polish remover. You still need quite a lot in the air to detect it. Like 15,000 parts per billion or so is when humans just start to detect it well enough to get it right 75% of the time when one of the test tubes has 15,000 parts per billion of acetone and the other doesn't. You might think nail polish remover is super easy to smell, but compared to some other things, it actually takes quite a bit before you can detect it at all. So going down the list here to some things that are a little harder to detect, uh, you can see formaldehyde, or sorry, a little easier to detect. You can see formaldehyde, uh, it, it can be picked up with very tiny amounts, and, and menthol is even easier, just 40 parts per billion of menthol, and we can detect that it's there at, at least slightly better than chance levels, right? The, the absolute threshold for you can just barely detect a super, super, super tiny amount of it. Meanwhile, there's a chemical called T-butyl mercaptan, which is so incredibly easy for us humans to detect. We can pick up like the tiniest amount in the air, a mere 0.3 parts per billion so this is actually why that chemical is added to natural gas. It helps people notice when there's a dangerous gas leak because natural gas doesn't have a smell to us humans. We can't detect it. We don't know if there's a leak, right? And that could be really dangerous. But gas companies then, they have to add T-butyl mercaptan to, to their gas so that if there's a leak, you'll know. The, the chemical smell of it, it kind of smells like rotten eggs, sort of. In fact, when, when you uh, flick on a gas stove top, you might sometimes catch a little whiff of something before the pilot light ignites the gas. That's T-butyl mercaptan. So that's really easy to detect, very low absolute threshold relative to other things like you know methanol. And even though olfaction is one of the lesser studied senses, there, there's still a lot of work out there. It's actually estimated that humans can discriminate. We can tell apart something like one trillion trillion 
different odors. Now, granted, we may not run into that, you know, that many different odors in a single human lifetime, but we would be able to tell them apart if tested. This is really impressive, right? When you compare it to something like vision, where humans can discriminate in vision at most a few million different colors. And something like hearing, for example, in audition, we can discriminate at most like 500,000 different tones, just half a million. And here with with the uh, smell, we're talking about a thousand billion different types, like an unimaginable amount of different types of smells that we could at least theoretically tell apart. If we put the two in front of us, we could say, yes, these are different versus these are the same. But in a psychophysical study, being able to tell that two smells are subtly different, that's one thing, but that's not the same as identifying what a smell is when you smell it. That's identifying an odor. Turns out, it's really difficult to identify odors. We actually suck at it. In fact, in controlled circumstances, like in a laboratory, without other hints or other contextual cues, just going off of smell alone, we're only successful in identifying odors about half the time. And actually, if you don't believe me, you can try a simple version of this at home. It, it won't be you know, as well controlled as a laboratory study or anything, but it'll give you the idea. You'll just need a, a partner or a family member or a friend, someone who can serve as the experimenter, and you can kind of try this on each other, right? Take turns using different smells each time. The person being tested should wear a blindfold or, or just carefully keep their eyes closed the whole time. Maybe um, if you want to be you know, crazy good about it, like maybe wear headphones playing white noise just to be super careful to avoid any auditory clues. But that, that's not as important if the person just tries not to make obvious noises. But then the experimenter will gather together a bunch of random objects. Like you can grab things from around the house, maybe indoor and outdoor or grab things from the dollar store or whatever else. Don't just go for things that you immediately think of as smell based. Like don't just compare 10 kitchen spices, but grab some random ass stuff like a pine cone from outside, a shoe, an egg, um, a book, a leaf, a piece of rubber or whatever. And while they're blindfolded, the experimenter just holds one item up close to their nose without touching the nose. You don't want them to, to feel the temperature or anything. Hold it up close to their nose and the person just breathes in with their nose and tries to guess what they're smelling. And you'll find you probably suck at this and you'll get it wrong for items you might think you would have been able to, to identify by smell. Now, studies do show if we're told the names of possible odors in advance, like what will be tested on, what might show up during this test, uh, and if we receive some feedback, if you fail along the way, people can quickly get up to like 98% accuracy. So we can do well if we've got some hints or some cues or some context. But without that, like just based on the molecules entering our nose alone, the odorants by themselves, we're not that great at identifying smells. And part of the reason olfactory identification is so damn hard is because it's hard to directly map odor experience to molecular shape. Like, you can see what I mean by looking at the, the molecules drawn here. In the, in the top half, panel A, just the top half of this diagram, we have two very similar looking chemical structures. Just a slight difference there, right? And yet to humans, one of those smells very clearly of musk, and the other has no smell at all to humans. So things with a very similar molecular shape can cause pretty different perceived smell experience. But also look at the bottom half, panel B here, and we've got some very, very different looking chemical structures, very different shapes, but they smell very similar to us. Both are actually described by everyone who smells them as a pineapple smell. And that's just the first complication that makes odor identification challenging. Like a lot of objects in the world that we think of as a single thing having a single smell, like bacon or orange juice or coffee, right? They have distinct smells. Those objects actually give off a ton of different molecules as odorants. So the, the smell of coffee has uh, around a hundred different molecules. And what's hitting our nose when we go down to the kitchen in the morning is not just the hundred molecules from the coffee smell, but a big mixed up clusterfuck of molecules from the coffee mixed with molecules from the bacon mixed with a bunch of different molecules from the orange juice, not to mention everything else in the background smells and whatever else might be in the room. So the brain has a pretty tough challenge. How the heck do we segregate the, the stream of odorants into distinct objects that we can identify and recognize and do things with? Like, how do we smell it as coffee smell plus bacon smell plus orange juice smell instead of just a jumble of molecule smells, right? 
this is the, the same kind of question we asked with audition, the sense of hearing, where the brain might just be getting a complicated jumble of sounds at all sorts of frequencies hitting the ear at the same time. Some from the guitar player, some from the bass player, some from the singer, some from background sounds, some from the conversation you're having. And your brain gets all of those frequencies hit in your ear at the same time and has to segregate, separate out that complicated mess of sound into distinct streams. That's what we called auditory stream segregation. We had the same issue with vision, right? What hits our eyes is a complicated mess of light patterns, but through those gestalt principles and heuristics, our brain is able to kind of guess at what is one object and what is a different object because of how the lines and edges have good continuation or how colors group together by the principle of similarity and so on. Well, the smell system has to face the same sort of challenge of, of stream segregation, of identifying individual objects in the world, despite what we're getting, what's hitting our detectors, is just a jumbled mess of input that's all mixed together. So how do we do it? Let's start with what happens to all those molecules when they land in our nose. You can see in the, the picture at the top here, the guy's face, we have our our mouth cavity, but above that, and actually connected towards the back, is our nasal cavity. When we smell something like a flower, the molecules are floating up in that nasal cavity, and they're hitting a kind of mucousy layer at the top of the nasal cavity called the mucosa, the olfactory mucosa. In the middle image here, the, the topmost layer there, that is bone. That's actually called the cribriform plate. That separates the nose, right, the, the nasal cavity, from the brain above it. So below the cribriform plate, below the bone, with all those colorful little neurons there in the middle image, that's the olfactory mucosa, the mucousy layer that's at the top of our nasal cavity, right, and top inside your nose. In that mucosa are embedded a ton of little neurons for olfaction. These are our detectors. We call them olfactory receptor neurons, or I'm just going to say ORNs for short, olfactory receptor neurons, which makes sense, the name, because they're, they're the sensory neurons for olfaction. And in the picture here, they've drawn three different types, the green ones, the reddish ones, and the purple ones, right? But in fact, our nose has about 350 different types. So 350 different styles of olfactory receptor neurons. Uh, and those neurons are, are where we transduce odorant molecules into neurons firing, right? Sending a pew, 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 pew signal to the brain. How they work is similar to what we saw with taste. They use a, a lock and key kind of system. So some chemicals activate an olfactory receptor neuron, while other chemicals don't. So each ORN, each of those olfactory receptor neurons, is sensitive to a specific kind of narrow range of molecules, narrow range that'll set them off. Only a select few shapes will fit into their keyhole well enough to open up the ion channels and make that neuron fire. So when we find that humans can discriminate or tell apart something like a trillion different odors, that's because we have 350 diff different types of ORNs uh, with with 350 types of ORNs with 350 different kind of colors of neurons that could be drawn in this picture here, we can get an unimaginably large variety of combinations of those 350. Like, imagine, I don't know, having 350 light switches, right? 350 things that could be set to just yes or no, on or off. Is the first of those types, is that turned on but not the others? That That's one possible combination. Is only the second one of the 350 turned on and none of the others? That's another combination. Maybe only the 350th is turned on and not the others. That's another possibility. But there's also a bunch of other combinations. Like it could be right now the 1st, 7th, 13th, 25th, 27th, 34th, 65th, 124th, 253rd, and 350th switch is turned on but not the others. And Obviously, you can see there are like a, a huge variety of different combos you could get just from having those 350 different switches. In fact, mathematically, it's, it's 2 to the 350th power, which is a number so large our, our little human monkey brains can't possibly comprehend it. Now, remember, in vision, with, with the visual sense, we only had four types of receptors that could go off. Right, Three types of cones for short, medium, and long wavelengths of light, and then our rods four types of receptors. Here we've got 350 different types, 350 different brands of receptor. So yeah, a lot of possible combinations that we could theoretically distinguish between. That's why we can get 
a trillion different smells that we could potentially tell apart, uh, whereas vision is much more limited. Now, what's happening is when any of those, those neurons there gets activated by having the right molecule fall into them, the signal, right, when the neuron fires, it goes pew, 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 and like its axon, you know, travels away from there, it needs to go towards the brain, the signals go up through that bony plate. You can see the axons kind of going up here on the, the right image here. They're going up. You follow the axons up. They cross into the brain. So what we're seeing at the top there above the cribriform plate, above the bone, is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is actually right above our nose. So we're, we're going up into the brain. There's an area uh, sort of right by there, the part of the frontal lobe, that we call the olfactory bulb. So this is part of the, the frontal lobe, but this is where specifically those wires go to first. It's called the olfactory bulb. We actually have one on each side because remember the lobes have a, a left and a right hemisphere. So we have a left frontal lobe and a right frontal lobe. So we have two olfactory bulbs, but I'm, I'm just going to call the combination the olfactory bulb. You get the idea. Now, where those axons go up, if you follow that diagram on the right, you'll see that for each color, right, each color of neuron, each type of ORN, it goes up to a little clump, a little, a little structure inside the olfactory bulb. That clump is called a glomerulus, or for plural, they'd be glomeruli. Now, again, in this picture, we see a green one, a reddish one, and a purple one, right? But remember, there would actually be 350 different types of glomeruli, like 350 different colors in this image if it was accurate and to scale. But the point is, each type of olfactory receptor neuron ends up going up to its same kind of glomerulus up there in the olfactory bulb inside the brain. Uh, another image of the, of the same thing is just here on the left, just to give you kind of the idea from a different angle. So you can see kind of all of the, the red ORNs are going to the same red glomerulus when they, when they get into the brain. All the blue ORNs, olfactory receptor neurons, that's back in the mucosa in the nose itself, right? Those all end up in the same place, the same type of glomerulus, the blue one here, once they get into the brain up there in the olfactory bulb. Now, different odorants, like different molecules from things out there in the world, will activate different combinations, different patterns of ORNs. Like in this diagram here, we've got five chemicals. This is just five random chemicals here, like octanoic acid and so on. And their uh, chemical structure is there on the right, which you can see they're, they're pretty similar. Now, what we're seeing in the table here is which olfactory receptor neurons fire. Now remember, there, there's a whole bunch of these neurons. There's 350 different types, but there's a ton of the actual neurons in there. But even of just like the different types of them, what we're seeing here is among just a little set that we've chosen, when someone smells like octanoic acid or these other similar odorants, uh, this is the combination of different neurons that are going off. We're, we've just picked up, you know, we're just watching um, ORN number one, number 18, number 19, and so on. You can see that, that ORN number one, it fires for some of those chemicals, but not others. Whereas ORN 19 fires for all of them, but ORN 86 only fires for non-anoic acid and, and none of the others. The, the point is different odorants set off different combinations or populations of neurons. So we can already see that we're, we're probably dealing with some population coding here, not specificity coding, even at this kind of early level of detection. Now, what's really cool about the olfactory bulb, the first part of the brain where the smell stuff goes, is that those glomeruli are organized in a systematic way. Within the olfactory bulb, just looking at which glomeruli are where and, and you know when they go off for different chemicals, we actually find it's really organized. So the ones that go off for one chemical are close to the glomeruli that in the olfactory bulb are close to the glomeruli that go off for a very similar chemical. Whereas those ones are, are pretty far away in the olfactory bulb from the glomeruli that go off for very different chemicals. So you can see the, the diagram here, kind of giving an example, looking at the left side first for all these um, carbox, carboxylic acids on the left. Uh, notice the chemicals are, are pretty similar here, right? They're, they're very similar. You can, you can see they cause similar uh, or even overlapping activity in terms of just where in the olfactory bulb we get some activity when someone smells these different chemicals, right? Very similar chemicals, very similar places in the olfactory bulb where activity is going off. But if we do different types of chemicals, like the aliphatic uh, alcohols here that you see on the right part of the diagram, 
all of those being pretty pretty similar in structure. They set off activity in a, a pretty similar part of the olfactory bulb, but all of those are in an area of the olfactory bulb that's pretty different, pretty far away from what other chemicals set off, like the carboxylic acids that, that we saw before. So we've got a mapping in the olfactory bulb, and it's based on chemical structure. So we call it a chemotopic mapping. Remember, in, in A1 of the brain, we had a tonotopic mapping based on frequency of sounds. In S1 of the brain, primary somatosensory cortex, we had a somatotopic mapping just based on which body parts are next to which in the brain, that, that little somatosensory homunculus. In V1, primary visual cortex of the brain, we had retinotopic mapping, like the close by places in our retina or our visual field are mapped out next to each other in V1 of the brain. And now we see a mapping for the olfactory bulb that's based on chemical structure. So it's a chemotopic mapping. And before you ask, no, I don't know why we don't just label this structure O1 and call it the primary olfactory cortex. That, that would make sense, right? But that's not the name. We call it the olfactory bulb. And as we'll see, it actually connects very early to some other places in the brain that, that help us process smell. So let's see where that, that signal goes after the olfactory bulb, where else in the brain it goes. And the, the picture here on the left, the brain picture here, we're actually looking at a brain from underneath. Like the, the front part of the brain would be at the top of this picture, but again, we're seeing it from underneath. The stuff at the bottom of the picture, lower down in the picture, that looks kind of different, that's the cerebellum at the, at the back and bottom of the brain. So anyway, you can, you can see in this image, they've labeled the olfactory bulb, that long kind of yellowish strip on each side, that's there where the frontal lobe would be. It's right at the underside of the frontal lobe. And remember, it's right above where our nose would be. So neural signals are going from our olfactory mucosa, which is in the nose itself, to the olfactory bulb right nearby, but now inside the brain. From there, like from there, the signal needs to go to other places in the brain. And the next big stop that we'll talk about is called the piriform cortex. You can see in the, the little diagram to the right here. The next main stop I want to talk about is the piriform cortex. Now you'll notice in this simplified diagram that the info also goes out to other areas immediately, like direct from the olfactory bulb to the amygdala. And, and you'll see that a lot of it is two directional. So like the olfactory bulb is getting feedback and directions and incoming signals from other parts of the brain too. But Let's look at the, this uh, piriform cortex specifically, the next main stop for smell processing. The piriform cortex, it shows a type of activity, a type of um, sort of behavior that, that's really, it's widespread and distributed activation, regardless of what we're smelling. For all smells, the piriform cortex shows this distributed activation where like, look at the brain scan in the upper left here. When someone's smelling just two very different chemicals, so hexanal versus uh, pentyl acetate, two just very different chemicals that, that they smell. If we're doing a brain scan during that, we see very different patterns of activity in the olfactory bulb. That makes sense because the olfactory bulb is mapped out chemotopically. So of course we'll see different activity patterns for different chemicals. But now look at the brain scan of what we see in the piriform cortex, right? The right side of these brain scans when smelling those two very different chemicals. In both cases, we're seeing activity all over the place throughout the whole piriform cortex. And that happens with basically everything we smell. We see the piriform cortex have activity all throughout in a very distributed manner. By the time we're to the piriform cortex, there, there's no chemotopic mapping anymore. So what is happening in the piriform cortex? How does it, how does it help us identify smells? Well, you can think of what's happening in the piriform cortex for a given smell, as like a very specific widespread pattern of activity that's across a big population of neurons. So when we smell one thing, a certain subset of all those neurons in the cortex goes off. Again, sort of spread across the whole dang piriform cortex structure. If we smell that exact same object again, like if you smell that same thing later, the same basic subset of neurons will go off. Smell it again and again and again, day after day, that same set of neurons spread across the piriform cortex, but sort of just a, a random subset of them, that same set of neurons will fire together in synchrony again and again and again as you smell it over and over and over again. And if you've taken like a cognitive psychology course, you know this is the fundamental way that memory is formed and laid down in the brain. Neurons that fire together wire together, we say. 
those neurons that, that keep going off in the same pattern, they get hooked up to each other so they can more easily fire together in the future via what we call synaptic plasticity or long-term potentiation. So due to all that kind of synchronized firing, they hook up together, meaning the pattern is getting sort of physically baked in or wired in to the piriform cortex here for a smell that we've you know encountered multiple times before. Similar to how memories in general get stored in a very distributed way across the whole brain. So what's happening is the pattern for a given odorant is learned over repeated exposure. It, it lays it down as basically a memory in the piriform cortex. It becomes something we can identify later. The pattern of neurons that has gone off a bunch of times before becomes something we can reactivate when we hear before. And, and it could have other connections, you know, set things off in the brain that, that we have associations with that smell. So if you smell something for the first time, it, it might just set off some random mix of neurons in the piriform cortex. And, and you'll have a perceptual experience of smelling something, right? The neurons are still going off, but you won't be able to identify it because it's new. You haven't made much of a memory of it. But if it's something you've smelled a hundred times, like bacon cooking, then reactivating that same pattern in a population of neurons across the whole piriform cortex makes it easy for the brain to recognize, oh, that's bacon. In other words, to associate it with other neural activity in your brain, like other bacon related activity, like the word bacon, what bacon looks like, your positive associations with bacon or whatever. So the first exposure to a new smell, like a brand new type of flower you've never smelled before, it's going to be hard for us to identify. Like consciously, we won't be able to identify what it is because the activation pattern is new. But repeat the exposure a lot and neural connections form. That's just long term potentiation. That's memories being laid down as a sort of odor object. That is a particular smell experience. That's what's learned and remembered. That's what's happening in the piriform cortex. So let's zoom back out for a moment and just kind of summarize that stuff. The ORNs, olfactory receptor neurons, they are our detectors, the sensory receptors for smell. They activate for a specific molecular shape. We've got about 350 different types, which means a ton of different combos we could detect. Then we get into the brain in the olfactory bulb. That's where there's some chemotopic mapping, and we see that that's organized for those kind of combinations of ORN activation, combinations of those 350 different types going off. Then we get to the piriform cortex, which has distributed activation, where kind of repeated exposure to the same activation pattern is gonna reinforce neural connections. We say cells that fire together, wire together. So it creates a memory, an, an odor that'll be recognized as an odor object, like, that's a coffee smell, or that's a bacon smell later on. Now, an important part of the pathway for olfaction in the brain is that those axons, the, the wiring of those neurons, they stay on the same side of the brain. Unlike every other sense we've discussed, olfaction is not contralateral. It doesn't cross over. So we process things from our left nostril in the left hemisphere of the brain, and things in our right nostril, they go straight up to the right olfactory bulb again, at the bottom of the right frontal lobe. So the other super weird thing about smell, about its, its wiring is it doesn't pass through the thalamus the way all of our other senses so far have. Remember the thalamus, our, our sensory gateway, it had lots of connections, not just going from the sensory receptors to the primary cortex for each sense. In other words, kind of going into the brain from the detectors, but also the thalamus had a lot of reverse inputs, like the brain connections coming in from other parts of the cortex to the thalamus. We talked about this a lot um, with vision. We talked about the, the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus for vision, just being part of the thalamus. But we saw there were a bunch of bi-directional inputs to the thalamus. It allowed for things like filtering the input. Uh, here with, with smell, with olfaction, we don't have the thalamus. But you can see maybe some similar functioning might be possible because the connections between that olfactory bulb and the other smell related brain areas, they're already bi-directional. There are signals going to the olfactory bulb from other parts of the brain, not just the incoming input from the, the ORNs, right, from our nose. So we do get some of that bi-directionality. We can potentially get some of those same benefits that the thalamus provides, but probably to a lesser extent with smell. Now, the reason smell is so different from the other senses in terms of not being contralateral and not going through the thalamus is likely because it's evolutionarily primary. It came first before other senses really developed in our far, 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 far back ancestors. 
which we can tell from paleontological records and studying the anatomy of creatures at kind of various parts of the phylogenetic tree. But it makes some sense when you think about it, just thinking back to the, the functions of olfaction we talked about for basic survival stuff like food, mating, familiarity, like basically navigating the environment and staying alive. Olfaction is pretty primary. So we think it probably came first. Now, as you can see here, the olfactory bulb, it also has some direct connection to other places in the brain, like some direct connection to limbic system structures, like the amygdala. This is another very basic area, right? An area that helps us learn, especially for things that involve fear, danger, protective rage, or even just other emotionally valent situations, emotion-related learning. And this makes some sense, given how much people report um, smells having kind of a strong emotional component and being so vividly associated with memories. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, I want to start with a famous quote by, by the author Marcel Proust. He's talking about basically a, a memory of dipping a little cookie, Madeline, into something as a kid and, and how the flavor, when he tastes it, the flavor of that type of cookie, the taste and the smell of it now sets off a really vivid memory for him from his childhood. So here's the quote. He says, the sight of the little Madeline, that's the, the kind of cookie, the sight of the little Madeline had recalled nothing to my mind before I tasted it. As soon as I had recognized the taste of the piece of Madeline soaked in her decoction of lime blossom, which my aunt used to give me, immediately the old gray house upon the street where her room was rose up like a stage set to attach itself to the little pavilion opening onto the garden, which had been built out behind it for my parents. And with the house, the square where I used to be sent before lunch, the streets along which I used to run errands, the country roads we took when it was fine. So... So seeing that food that's strongly associated with past memories of his childhood, seeing the food doesn't do much. Vision didn't help here. But the taste and smell that comes when he puts it in his mouth, boom, a flood of memories. This has actually been named the Proust effect after him. And it happens to all of us. The Proust effect is when we have like an involuntary memory that gets evoked by, by taste and smell, by gustation and olfaction. These senses which again, we'll, we'll see soon, are very closely related. They seem especially connected to our, our old memories or our emotional memories. So the Proust effect is, is an example of that. Indeed, emotions play a strong role in all memory, but especially in involuntary memories, ones where you're not trying to think of something that just kind of comes to you or it's provoked by a cue, a reminder. So for example, studies show that uh, memories with strong emotion like your wedding or an intensely stressful situation, those are recalled easier and quicker than unemotional or more neutral memories. Uh, also, for involuntary memories, happy ones show up twice as often as neutral ones. Like we're more likely to have an emotional memory get evoked than, uh, you know, ev involuntarily than a neutral memory. Also, there's something called the reminiscence bump you might have heard of, where memories that are that are formed in our adolescence and early adulthood, they're actually remembered better and more likely to come up involuntarily than those that we formed later in our life. And there are a few hypotheses about why this is, but one possibility is a lot of heavy emotions showing up with very novel situations during this stage of life. Emotion and memory are sort of tightly linked. So olfaction, as we saw, it has an especially direct pathway to some limbic system structures, some emotion and memory parts of our brain. Like we saw that especially direct pathway to the amygdala. And, and indeed, it's also hooked up. It's very close to the, the hippocampus, which you may remember the hippocampus is really important for forming new memories. So we actually find a lot of empirical work demonstrating the, the connection of, of memories with smell specifically. Like in 2002, there was one where uh, Herz and Schuler found that what they, they basically had subjects um, kind of describe a personal memory associated with various objects. They give them like crayons and say, uh, think of a personal memory associated with that or sunscreen or something like that. Then later in a, in a testing phase, they were presented with either the smell of the object, like your eyes are closed and, and you're smelling a crayon or you're smelling sunscreen, or with a picture of the object. So either an olfactory cue or a visual cue. And then they were asked to, to sort of just uh, think and report about the event that they had described earlier. And in the results, what these researchers found, those who had smelled, who had been kind of cued to the memory via smell rather than cued to the memory versus uh, from vision, the, the objects that they were, that 
that they were primed with or whatever, they had more vivid and emotional memory of those things. Um, more vivid and emotional memory reported. Also a stronger feeling of being brought back to that episode if you were cued by a smell rather than a, a sight of the same exact object that's associated with that old memory. So smell just be um, seems better at pulling out those old, especially emotion-related memories. Now, this kind of thing leaves open an alternative possibility to explain it. Like, does the emotion that we have in these odor-evoked memories, does it happen simply because smelling odors also activates the nearby amygdala as a side effect? Or does smelling odors specifically tend to elicit those especially emotional memories? So these are two different things that would explain the data we saw. Uh, and I don't want to get into all the details here, but I'll just say evidence so far hints at the latter of those. That smell is truly better at just bringing back emotional memories. It's not just that, that smell memories also as a side effect happen to turn on the amygdala during their recall. All right. I think that's enough for smell for, for this video. In the next video, we're going to bring together those chemical senses of, of smell and taste and see some multi-sensory interactions, some ways in which the, the two senses interact and how they're related, and even some ways that they interact with the non-chemical senses. So in the next video, we're going to visit Flavortown.